Hello and welcome to the next episode of Blabbing Translators, the first live talk show about translation and translators. My name is Yelena Tereshenkova and uh, with me today is my co-host Dmitry Kornyhov. Hello Dmitry. Hi guys. And our guest today is Steve Vitek. Uh, hi Steve. Hi Yelena. Hi Dmitry. <laughs> Steve uh, is a, a, a patent translator. He translates patents. Uh, he has been translating patents for the past almost 30 years, right? Since 20. nine? Yeah, almost. Yeah. Uh, from, from and into different languages. And you, most of you probably know him because of his uh, blog, the Patent Translators blog. Uh, so, and the subject of our talk today is the translation industry. And, but before we started, Steve, could you please tell us a few words about yourself? Okay. Um, I was born uh, and raised in Czechoslovakia. Um, I lived in Prague until 1981. I um, um, graduated in Japanese studies. My minor was uh, English and I worked as a translator um, about a year in Prague and then I emigrated to West Germany and then from West Germany in 1982 I emigrated to California and then I moved uh, 15 years ago here to Virginia where I am now and I started translating as an independent translator in 1987 and that's what I've been doing ever since. Mostly Japanese, German, and French. A few, I also know, I also translate some time from uh, Czech, Slovak, and Polish. And I also translate uh, sometime patents into other languages like Japanese, German, and French through other patent translators. That's quite a story, <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I can say so. <laughs> Um, have you started uh, with patents translation uh, while you still lived in Czechoslovakia, or how did you get into that? No, but I remember that when I was in second year, uh, some student from a technical university came with a, a Japanese article and uh, in, in a technical journal, and it was very complicated for me, but I did translate it. And um, as payment, I told him he, he, that I wanted a bottle of rum. So, he <laughs> <laughs> so then when I became translator in San Francisco, at first I was getting uh, simple things like uh, Japanese games. Mm. And mm -hmm. um, I, I was doing that for about two or three years, but uh, I really you know, I was doing anything that came my way, anything that the agencies in the Bay Area would send me. And uh, the one thing that was really difficult and th that I didn't really like too much were patents, Japanese patents. And then I realized, well, anybody, just about anybody who knows some Japanese can translate Japanese games. But these, so if I want to find something that uh, gives me some... Uh, uh, job security, it should be something that's more difficult than that. And I decided to go for patents. And what was the patent market back then and compared to now? Is it any different? It is different um, because back then uh, it was a completely different situation. There was no internet in 1987 mm -hmm. up until about 1984, basically. 1994, people were using mm. internet basically only for emails. So uh, people were facing different uh, difficulties than today. For instance, you know, uh, the agency would send me a third generation fax, which would be illegible if it was in Japanese and things like that. Uh, back then, there was a bigger demand for what's called prior art, which is existing technology research. Um, because there was no machine translation. Uh, today, you can go on uh, different websites like uh, Japanese Patent Office, European Patent Office website, and everything, you can easily translate everything 
using machine translation, and that will give you some idea of uh, uh, what's in the book, especially from languages like German and French. So there's less work in that area, I think, but there's still a lot of work uh, even in existing technology. And there is a lot of work for uh, new patents to be filed. Okay, so for instance, if a, if a Japanese patent or German patent was filed in Japan or Europe, and then they want to file it in English uh, in Europe or in United States, they need to translate it. And that cannot be done with machine translation. So things, things are different, but similar. In some way, they're better because most of the documents I translate are clearly legible. I can use machine translation myself. In some mm -hmm. ways, they are worse because I'm uh, dealing with competition in countries like China or India. And uh, because some of the work, I think, I don't really know that, but I think some of the work was eliminated by machine translation. Hmm. And what, what were your biggest struggles when we were just starting out uh, as a translator back then? You know, the biggest, tr uh, the biggest problem probably is uh, that you need lack of confidence in yourself. Mm -hmm. And that hmm. probably hasn't changed in 30 years. You have to believe in yourself and you just have to keep, keep on going. Um, so the other thing is uh, lack of uh, resources like uh, reliable dictionaries. Mm -hmm. um, and that these days is not a problem because yeah. you can find just about anything on internet. Yeah, that's for sure. What about the, biz the business skills? Business skills, you know, now we probably getting into the topic that we were going to talk about. Uh, back then, if you like in the 80s, in the 90s, up until about early 2000, um, you didn't need a lot of business skills if you had um, a good language like Japanese or German or probably uh, even Russian, um, because uh, an agency would. Um, first send you a small job and if it turned out that you did it well then they would try to keep you you know once you established your rate with the agency there was really no incentive for them to uh, try to replace you um, because they needed somebody reliable somebody who does good work and that has changed you know these days uh, you would probably agree with me that uh, the pressure on rate is so big that uh, you know it's it's a very different world did you work a lot with agencies back then when starting uh, out or in the 90s yes i worked only for agencies hmm. for about the first uh, three years and i still work for agencies uh, mm -hmm. so sometimes i am the agency sometimes i work for um, direct clients most of the time about 60 70 percent of the time and sometimes i work uh, for an agency how so, long have you been working with these agencies that you are still working with now you know for one of them for over 20 years hmm. uh, but the guy he, he had a small agency um he died uh, this year <laughs> So they have been dying on me, you know, I'm 64. <laughs> they, when I was starting out, they were like uh, 10, 15, 20 years older. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I re recently, I, I tried to find them on the internet and I saw obituaries for like three people. Mm. So, uh, but with some of them, I was for a very long time. And with some of the direct clients, I was for more than 10 years and... You know, clients come and go. You have to, the business uh, side of the translation um, business uh, is, is much more important these days because things are not as permanent as they were a decade or two decades ago. Since so you say that, 
Go ahead. Sorry, Yelena. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, so you say that uh, agencies uh, used to operate quite differently back then. Uh, when have you noticed uh, when it all has changed? When those uh, big corporations started to emerge? Yes. And why did why did it happen? I think it's it's the uh, general corporatization of our world, mm. and that has uh, impact also on translation. Um, and I think things are things were starting to change for worse about after the year 2000. And I, I can give you an example of a, of a big agency that I used to work for a lot, actually. Well, a lot, like several long patents a month, usually. Uh, and I'm talking about WordPerfect, okay? Uh, th this is one of the largest uh, translation agencies um, today in the translation business. I started working for them around 1994. And uh, back then it was a small agency. I knew the coordinators, they paid on time, they paid good rates. I had absolutely no problems with them and, and I was very anxious to keep them happy. Once I remember, I, um, they paid late. Uh, one invoice, it was like $70. And I complained on a computer, CompuServe, I don't know if you know what it is, but there was a forum for translators like popular 20 to 30 years ago. And I complained there and I named them. And the the woman who's the owner, one of the two owners, I forgot her name, um, she called me and she apologized and she sent mm. me the check by Federal Express. I got it next day. Okay. Mm. That would never happen these days. It's uh, th That was the... Uh, atmosphere and and the relationship between the translators and and the agency owners it was very different you know they you you, you could feel that they appreciated you and they didn't see it as them being the slave owner and you being the slave that's very much the case these days if you work for a certain type of big corporation corporate uh, translation agency i don't know if you would agree with me but that's my impression, and that's why I stopped working for ninety-nine percent of them. I basically had to. I didn't want to, but I saw no choice. Yeah, I kind of feel that the, the part of the problem is that uh, many of those agencies that uh, that we call like big agencies, uh, I think they most of them are managed by people who are not translators, right. who are business executives, right. and uh, I kind of have the feeling that. Uh, they they focus on revenues, which is great, uh, and it's okay. We lost Mitri for a second, but uh, while he's trying to call in again, um, I, I I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a little more on what you call a translation industry, and why you think it's important to uh, see it for what it is. Because I know I I remember I, I saw it in in some. Uh, in some of the discussions that um, some of our colleagues don't see the difference between the translation industry and the translation profession. And I think it's important. I, I understand what you mean. And I really think that it's important to uh, see that point. Yes, that's actually what one commenter uh, who is a translator in Australia made clear to me that we should, we should uh, make sure that we make a clear distinction between translation as a profession and translation as an industry. Um, as you said, um, the big corporations, uh, translating agency, the mega agencies, and even the smaller ones, these days are usually run by people who are not translators, who don't understand uh, translation issues, who are monolingual, who are, uh, maybe they have an MBA, uh, who are the business type of entrepreneur. And they uh, run it as just, they would be running a, a car wash or, or something like that. And that is a big problem. Um, uh, 20, 30 years ago, when I was starting out, most agencies that I worked, basically all of them, 
were run by, were small and they were run by people who knew other languages and most of them were um, translators also or former translators. So it's much easier to communicate uh, with people like that than with the new kind of uh, corporate management of uh, translation agencies. This is very interesting because earlier in our um, conversation, you mentioned that you basically didn't need any business skills and right. agencies were run by basically by translators. And now when agencies are run by entrepreneurs, we translators, uh, because I'm personally, I'm more a translator than an entrepreneur. It's something I have to do. I also enjoy do I enjoy doing it. Uh, but for, first, first of all, I'm a translator. So we translators have to have business skills now because now basically everything is about business. Although right. some corporations say that uh, client is something that they care most about, but um, I sometimes doubt it <laughs> as well. Yes. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a friend in San Francisco who back in the 80s, was a well-known Japanese technical translator. He worked basically for one a translation agency and the agency was uh, a former translator. Uh, he was translating German and some other European languages and he needs a reliable translator for, for Japanese. So this, this friend of my translator, who was, as it happened, lived just a few houses uh, away from where I lived, uh, he didn't have a business card, okay? Mm. I don't think, I don't think he, has a, he had a resume, but he kind of <laughs> bragged about it. You know, he said, I don't need a business card. <laughs> his, his, uh, the agency he worked for, their client was General Electric. So he kept saying, well, I don't have to worry about these things. General Electric is not going to go out of business. Mm. General Electric did not go out of business. But uh, the managers who used to send him these translation projects decided just to get rid of them. <laughs> and he <laughs> lost this client. And it was very, after I don't know how many years, and it was very difficult for him to uh, you know, restart his business. But back then, it was possible to work for a couple of agencies. I knew, I knew several people like that who basically had no business skills. And who didn't need them because, you know, there was so much demand for Japanese technical translation back then. I, these days, I think it's very different. If you don't have business skills, so it's going to be a, a struggle to keep your business running. Do you mean uh, for someone who is just starting out or is it the same for you? I need to keep um, upgrading my business skills and learn from young people like you. You know, because you understand things differently than people my generation, and uh, and I do learn a few useful things this way. So every everybody has to have work on his or her business skills these days. And one of the important things for me was the website, and still is. But there are other things, you know, uh, social media, for example, uh, can be important too. And I had no idea even what it is uh, just a few years ago. It was it was a hot topic at uh, the, the conference in Prague about the social media. Yes. <laughs> and I also, I partly agree with those who say that they are very important. And I partly agree with those who say that they're not important because uh, it largely depends on, on the industry you work in. It's it's there is no there is no universal approach to the social media and to anything else actually. Well, they are important, but indirectly, I think for me. Anyway. Mm. For example, you know, I've had my blog for about uh, six years, and somebody of your generation had to tell me, "Look, Steve, you have to put a Facebook button." and Twitter mm. and, and Google Plus on your uh, blog, otherwise you won't get any reader, readers. Mm. And and I didn't understand even what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I was, oh yeah, I think about it. And you know, 
the the block, for example, your block can be very important. Uh, if you combine it with uh, with uh, social media and with um, with your website, because um, I had the website for fifteen years or more, and the blog has much more traffic. Mm -hmm. But the thing, and I, I mostly write, write just whatever I feel like talking about and i mostly talk to people like you to translators yeah and mostly to young translators and um, the thing is the google and other search engines they they link your blog to to your website and it it puts for example my website because of the blog partially i think very high up in the google ranking that's so on that, the first page Right. So that means that I don't have to pay for uh, uh, advertising on Google, which is very ex expensive. You have to pay like $15 per click. I think somebody told me, I don't know what it is, mm. but you know, I can this way because I have material that's relevant both on the blog, relevant to my field, patent translation, both on the blog and on the website. And because it's connected to social media, I can compete with uh, huge companies, uh, huge translation agencies, uh, and actually place higher than they. And they have to spend thousands of dollars for this type of advertising. So mm. the that's how social media, blogging, and all these things uh, are important, or, although they do not usually at least not in my case they do not bring me direct clients but mm -hmm. they expose you to the world and that's important yeah i'm absolutely agree with you steve i and i also gotta say that uh, the name of your blog and the name of your website which is patent translator uh also plays a major role in how people find you because this is what people are looking for if they go on google they're gonna right. look for a patent translator and if i if i go open it a tab in my uh, browser right now and, and type patent translator i'm probably going to land right on your on your website because uh you, you choose this domain name very smartly back then back in the days when you decided to well, write this website. Really, so kudos to you <laughs> that was really a coincidence i i uh, i called a small company uh, internet provider in silicon valley and there was a guy a young guy his name was tracy and he sounded like a teenager, you know. And so I, I ex explained to him that I had no idea what I, I was trying to do, but this is what I wanted a a, a, uh, a blog, uh, not blog. Nobody knew blogs. Yeah. <laughs> translation, and he went to Network Solutions. I didn't know what Network Solutions is, and and he were, was looking for the available domain domains. And I picked uh, patent translators, patent translator, and about three or four other ones. And basically, because I did that, you know, that uh, played a huge role in the further development of my business. That uh, made it possible for me to make connection directly with direct clients without having to rely on translation agencies for the most part, if unless I really like them and, you know. And and you guys can do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it's diff more difficult now, but basically the same principle applies, I think. Yes, absolutely. So uh, let's circle back to the topic of our conversation. Uh, we're talking about the, 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 the past, the present, and the future of the translation industry. So uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, this big corporation started to emerge, uh, which basically turned in... Uh, us simple translators into slaves and little cogwheels in their machines like you like to describe it on your on your blog so uh, my question is why did translator not uh, i don't i don't feel like translators really resist that those those big corporations do they or maybe i'm not, just noted not noticing it not enough in my opinion because uh, uh you know when and, and a translation agency wants to put you on their list of uh, suppliers of translations and and let's understand it 
they are not language service providers. We are. We mm. who translate, who interpret, we provide the service. They are just brokers. Some of them are very good brokers. Some of them are very knowledgeable, but most of them don't know anything about anything really. Especially the, the big ones, they, they are just, uh, you know, their specialty is in buying something at a low price and selling it at a high price. That's the way I see it anyway. Um, so now I've lost my train of thought. Uh, what, was your, what was your question? Uh, my question was, why did, uh, did why do translators don't really resist? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't realize that if a translation agency contacts them and it, there's a non-disclosure agreement, which has three, four, five thousand words, that has all kinds of insane stipulations, like that they have the right to to visit you in your office, to check on your computer, on, or, or the, uh, that uh, if they decide to sue you, you have to pay for their attorney. <laughs> That's often found in, in, in these contracts. They will just sign it thinking that this will never be enforced and it's irrelevant, which is true. Uh, most of the time it will never be enforced. But when you sign something like that, they know that they have a slave. Okay, that whatever they say, you just do it. Um, if translators agree to, for example, uh, work as post processors of uh, machine translations, well, they are digging their own graves. Uh, it's like when a worker in Detroit agrees to a train um, a, 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 an Indian or Chinese guy who will then you know, move back to India or China and, and do the same work for uh, a tenth of the, of the cost, you know. They, I don't think they um, realize the consequences of, uh, of uh, going along with, the, with, with what's going in the translation industry. And I think we have to resist. We have to insist on... on um, being treated as uh, partners, not as slaves. And uh, we have to um, basically work outside of the um, translation industry uh, that I just described, by which I mean, we have to try to make, mostly make direct contact with direct customers and failing mm -hmm. that work mostly for small, decent, decent agencies that treat us as human beings, not as cogs in a huge wheel, easily replaceable. And the problem is uh, that not even our associations are talking about this. I mean, I mean, I don't know what's going on in Russia or in Canada, but uh, here in the United States, you know, the ATA basically works for, for the corporate agencies the way I see if you know, I, I have been a member for many years, that, and I've never read anything about the topics that we have just been covering, uh, dealing with with the problems in, in with the corporate translation industry. I've never read about it in any uh, issue of the their magazine. Just these problems simply do not exist as as far as the this association is con concerned. So we have to create associations, organizations that will really work for us, that will defend us, you know, that we can rely on. Not, the, not, that, uh, not those that work for, just for the brokers, you know. The brokers have a right to make a living, but they cannot treat us the way they want to treat us and that they are treating us these, these days. And uh, why do you think uh they treat us this way simply because uh, they want to make more money or this is like a conscious decision to, you know, no, kind of control, control the masses. And, you know, it's not that they are bad people. It's some of them are, but most of them are probably just regular people. Uh, they want to make more money. It's basically greed. And also, as you said, they don't know anything about translation. They don't know anything about languages. So they consider us just, 
cheap hired help, basically. The cheaper, the better, you know. To them, we are just uh, an expense that needs to be minimized in order to maximize the profit. That's all. So I think, how can we show our value then? By making them irrelevant. And you make them irrelevant if you are able to um, establish contact directly with direct clients and prove to them that your work is much better in all respects. And that, you know, and then they will stay with you and they will keep you busy. And you don't have to worry about the, the translation industry. To hell with them, who cares? Mm -hmm. And if more and more people are doing it and they get, they get together, you know, for instance, I may be working as an agency and, and you may be working as a translator for me. And, and you know, next time it may be reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if we keep creating this kind of uh, pattern, that will make them irrelevant as far as our work is concerned. And they will have to work only with uh, beginners, you know, and people who live, uh, uh, you know, somewhere in, I don't know, India maybe. Because back then, back there, whatever they get paid is, is pretty good money. But not, not in Canada or not in the United States. And do you think uh, they will eventually crash and burn based on their current business model by buying cheap uh, translation services and working with uh, non-professionals? Do you think that the future is not very bright for those kind of organizations or they, they are going to they are here to stay? I do. I do. I think that a certain percentage of them uh, will basically disappear, especially those that uh, emphasize uh, tools, language tools, technology that uh, are trying to use um, translators only as word, uh, as machine translation, post processors. Uh, they mostly uh, are living of uh, investors' money. And I think that uh, this model, which is very popular right now, will disappear eventually. I was contacted several times by an agency that uh, a new brand new agency that just bought a website and they use Microsoft Translator and then they pay uh, tra human translators to post process uh, that output and they want to use two layers of human translation, you know, and each translator, uh, each human translator would get one cent per word. And they think that if it's uh, this garbage that comes from machine is uh, processed by two people that it will be twice as good. <laughs> they just stupid. They don't know anything about anything. It's never going to work. And uh, whoever invested money in them, or if they were, maybe they invested their own money, uh, they will go bankrupt. But the that's only a part of, of the new uh, model, business model. You know, the, the big agencies like uh, TransPerfect or, or what are the European ones? Uh, big word and uh, line bridge, probably. Yeah, they will survive. I mean, they learn from their mistakes, and they are run by smart people. They may be very ruthless and just as inimical to translators as as uh, the ones I just described. But they will probably survive. The the thing is, what they produce is likely to be of a very pu poor quality uh, because of the methods they use and because they don't really understand languages and translation. And that is an advantage that uh, translators like us have because we understand what we're doing and they don't. So we can compete with them on that level rather than just on, pri on the level of you know, lower prices. So, but you know, the, the agencies are not gonna go away anytime. They will survive me <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> a portion a portion of them will go bankrupt but uh, i don't know what the percentage will be so why do you think that uh, agencies who produce low quality translations will still survive this is something that i just can't i just can't understand because probably it's uh, because of the nature of translation as a product because few clients can actually estimate the results and Probably if someone localizes uh, their website into Russian, they will get results. They could have gotten much better results if they used 
uh, if they uh, ordered the trans bought a translation from a more experienced translator and not from a huge corporation uh, who uses cheap translators. But they still get a result, and they just don't understand. They, they just ha don't have a chance to see the difference. Probably that's the reason. That's uh, a big part of the reason because those uh, companies that uh, use uh, poor quality uh, translations on their websites, uh, the people who the important people who run things over there, they have no idea that it's horrible Russian or horrible French. And they will only find out if, if there something horrible happens and, mm. and uh, customers complain or they lose uh, market share. And that takes a long time, several years. So at that point, they may realize it. But at that point, there will be another uh, manager there. So in big corporations, you know, nonsensical things uh, are very common. Um, and uh, common sense is very uncommon. And it takes a long time before problems are fixed. Do you think that uh, this, uh, how should I put it, this uh, acceptance of low quality translation, do you think that uh, it can influence um, the whole, I don't want to say industry, but this whole field? Because uh, low quality becomes a standard. Yes. And it deteriorates the quality, uh, the, probably the quality requirements uh, become lower and people are ready to um, accept poor quality and to live with it. And they just don't need high quality translations. And that stops being our um, unique selling yes, proposition. I'm or getting a message that uh, Bayer is running out. So I had to connect the uh, battery okay. but now it's difficult for me to position yeah the, the it's difficult to define the term quality and the people yeah. who make decisions are don't understand it you know and even if when you say low quality unless it's it's a really horrible quality um, if it still works it still works and if it's cheaper than something that is much better uh, but it's it's uh, that difference in quality is something that the person who makes the decision cannot uh, understand then it's gonna stay you know like that for a very long time maybe for de decades so this is a complicated uh, issue there's one thing i think uh, one uh, example translators can use to prove that quality is important is that uh, companies usually spend a lot of time, money and efforts uh, on copywriting. So they understand the importance of copywriting, but uh, translation, um, especially in, the, in some, I, I'm talking about translations, which I'm mostly working on about creative translations. It's basically the same. So I think it's it's something that that could be used in this respect. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand you correctly. Uh, because I'm getting what? messed on the screen. I was reading it. <laughs> <laughs> could you, I'm sorry. Could you repeat it? What I mean is that companies understand the importance of good, uh, of high quality copy on their website and in their, in their marketing material. They understand that they have to uh, hire a good copywriter. Right. But okay. uh, with translations, it's basically the same because translators, uh, yes. when we when we translate uh, they, good they copy, not, they may not realize it right away. Mm. Uh, one way is to. Uh, make them realize it, uh, you know, and uh, this is something that, uh, for instance, Chris Durbin was talking about in Prague, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in, uh, also in different translation fields, uh, different things are important and less important. Uh, in my case, since I translate patents, uh, the uh, technical terms are important and understanding of the source yeah. document. But that's basically it. So as long as I follow the field in several languages and, and uh, 
as as long as I'm able to translate these documents from one language or another into English, then it's very good quality because the lawyer has to use it, for instance, to uh, file a new patent. So he has or she has to avoid areas that were already covered in another patent application and concentrate on the new aspects of the new patent. So, you know, quality means something else in your field, for instance, maybe in Dmitry's field and, and in my field. Yeah. Uh, but the, the truth, it is probably true that uh, the clients in the last 10, 15 years got used to low quality and that has become standard. I believe that. In personal. Mm. But that is also an advantage that uh, we can use because most cl some clients will not really see the difference, but most clients will see and appreciate the, the quality, uh, you know, provided by some guy who works, you know, as an agency in a kitchen on a laptop, you know, in China, who has no idea what he's dealing with. And, and you, you know, I get all the time offers from, from agencies like that somewhere in China and they want to work for me and their English is horrible and they want to translate Russian, one of the languages from an interaction. Mm. They would be... I'm sure they would have no, absolutely no idea what the translation is. So it's a good thing on, on the other hand that we, the band, there's so many of the fly by night uh, uh, outfits like that out there, but it's a good thing that mm -hmm. we can, comp you know, that our, what we produce is much, much better than comparison. But the key is making connection with the right kind of supplier who work. And the big agencies are not that. Mm. I agree. Okay, uh, we have a, a question from uh, one of our viewers, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, Simon asks, speaking about the future of translation, in your opinion, can crowd translation platforms, uh, which usually have amateur translators on board, compete with old school translation service providers who cooperate with professionals? On certain kind of uh, translation, yes. The kind that's not important, that otherwise would not be translated at, at all. But on anything that, for instance, sells, or, or that on anything that is important, such as financial documents or patents or, or articles from technical journals, absolutely not, obviously. But there's a lot of material that uh, uh, doesn't really need to be translated, but uh, the corporations may perceive it as as very positive if it, if it is translated, and even if the translation is horrible, as long as it's cheap, they'll take it. So, in that area, I mean, I would not. It's best probably to stay out of this kind of translation if you are a real human translator. <laughs> I, I I read an article. Somebody sent me a link to my uh, blog about a Korean guy who just started uh, an outfit <laughs> like that. And he was saying in that article that uh, anybody working on, a, on an iPhone uh, sitting on a bathroom throne, mm -hmm. translate, you know, uh, that it's, it's a good thing to use people like that because they don't have to waste time. They can make money this way. It's completely idiotic. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, this this kind of business will uh, go bankrupt, obviously. It's only a matter of time. But these outfits keep cropping up like mushrooms after rain, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a different world and kind of crazy. I kind of feel they, they have their, their own purpose and they serve their own segments. So yeah. like you said, uh, uh, they cannot really compete with people who translate patents or people who translate something uh, that requires creativity, like marketing copy or books, right. uh, or even. So it's important. Yeah, so I'm sorry. It's it's important for new translators to realize this, and realize that they want to stay away from things that are too easy. You know, just like I realized almost 30 years ago, or maybe 20. 627 that I don't want to specialize in uh, Japanese games uh, because uh, it's too easy. 
Mm-hmm. And somebody else will do it much better. And uh, it's, 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 it makes more sense to find something that's much more difficult. If I want to have some job security. And normally if it's more difficult, it's probably more of a premium market kind, right? Right, right. Yeah, well, some people call it premium. But it has to be specialized. You, uh, I mean, I believe that a translator should be flexible enough to translate just about anything, but not mm-hmm. everything equally well. And that uh, one has to specialize in the field and be really, really good at it. It takes time, but... Uh, uh, I don't think this thing is plugged in. Because uh, I see, I thought it was, let me see. So do you guys have more questions? Yelena, you had a question? Yes, I had a question too. Um, we could uh, just go back a little to what you were saying earlier. Um, something that... Uh, I can't help thinking every time I hear about these new technology things like uh, machine translation post editing or and things like that. Um, they are pronounced to be something quite new and something that has changed the industry, but what uh, those uh, people who advertise them don't talk about is that they still need human translators or two, as you mentioned it, Uh, to actually have a product that they can sell. And my question is, why do you think uh, translators participate in that? Or aren't all those people, or can those people be called translators? Because uh, I personally can't think that I'm going to do to work on machine translation post-editing because probably because uh, English, Russian machine translation is horrible. With other languages, it might be a little different. With English, with French to English, it might be a little different. Um, but so why do you think? Is it lack of confidence or something else? Well, they need the money, you know. Uh, mm. A lot of people are just desperate for money these days. The situation, the economic situation in many countries is pretty bad. So... Uh, just a little bit of money may be life-saving really so i don't blame them for doing that mm. and uh, but uh, that's not the way to go i think they should, if they want to be slaves it's their choice but that's all they will be and uh, it's it's never gonna work uh, post processing of uh, Machine translation cannot work because a machine translation is not translation. It's just a, an aggregate, an agglomeration of words. It's basically mm. the same thing like a paragraph in in a, in a, in a dictionary. And sometimes it's applicable, sometimes it's partially applicable. A lot of time it's complete nonsense. Um, and if the moment you let a, a, a a machine translates something, you kill basically the spirit of the conversation. And you cannot uh, revive it anymore. You can just make it somewhat understandable as a post-processor. Machine translation is, a, is, a, is an excellent invention. It's a very good tool, but a, a, a tool that can be used well, mostly only by translators. Mm. Because it, unless you know both languages, You don't understand which parts of the machine translated text are wrong and how to fix it. So it is not a replacement for human translation at all. And it never will be. So you know, what do you machine... think? I'm sorry, go ahead. What do you think will be the future of translation? Will there still be human translators <laughs> 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Human translators will be still here 100 years from now. But uh, I think it's important to, to uh, understand how the uh, translation um, business, quote unquote, works to avoid the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. It is important to understand how things like a language technology, quote unquote, and, and 
tools work to use them without being fooled into thinking that they will replace uh, humans. And uh, it is important for translators who want to, uh, who enjoy their profession and as I have for many years and um, who want to be able to make a good living for many years to come to um, pick the right field to specialize in it and once you become a specialist and once you have some some business skills and business savvy it shouldn't be that that complicated uh, you know you just need a little bit of luck that's that's the third component and some of us will have it and some of us will not but people also say that you know luck luck is what you make of things and that's true too you think we still uh, need, need some kind of uh, you know skills to be able to adapt to the change in ever changing world because you talked about how uh, you you you, ha you, ha you can learn from young people and we can learn from you do you think uh, this will be even more important in the future this exchange of uh, yes, ideas I, between translators yes, and uh, yes I do especially since uh, our associations, associations of translators do such a poor job of uh, keeping us informed and, and fighting for for us, you know. They seem to be more, more not some, all of them, but some of them for sure, in the camp of the uh, translation industry that is using us as uh, cheap basically. So it's important to exchange information on blogs, on forums such as this one, uh, and it's a great thing, and I hope it will continue. Thanks. We hope so too. <laughs> we really enjoy. <laughs> we we are having great time every Wednesday. It's something I look forward to every week. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a highlight of my week too. I mean, being able to talk to real people, uh, ex escaping this cabin fever, yeah. and having like actual conversation with. Uh, like my colleagues and people who care about this profession, I think it's a, I think it's an amazing opportunity, and I hope that uh, our viewers who are watching this right now uh, will also enjoy it, and uh, uh, this this will continue. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, this will inspire other people uh, to be more active and to share more, and you know, to be more open and uh, have uh, real time real uh, real conversations about uh, important topics. Because, like you said. Uh, translation uh, associations are not doing a very good job and I think it's up to us to determine what kind of future we will have and to put the pressure to put pressure on them to do a better job finally hmm. yeah we, we, we can actually do that too uh, especially those who are belong to professional associations I think uh, it's a normal uh, way of thinking that uh, associations should fight for our rights and protect them right Right, and they don't. On the contrary, they pretend to, but you know, it's like the politicians, they <laughs> screw you every, every chance they get. Yeah, so uh, let's wrap uh, this blab up. I know your battery is running very low and we've been well, no, it probably for... Works. It probably works. It was at 9% and now it's at 8 and it's <laughs> it <to> be constant <laughs> at 8, so it probably works, but the... Uh, very slowly and normally i see a green <laughs> green bar there and now i see only a red one but it's still at eight percent so it, it should last until the end mm. okay <laughs> well we, we've been uh talking for almost an hour now so uh i guess uh, my next question is more about uh the future and what kind of advice would you give to young people who are just starting out in this profession That's tough. <laughs> it, um, if they really like what they're doing, it's important to believe in yourself and to uh, try to uh, follow what is going on uh, through blogs and different fora like this to figure out the best field that 
to specialize in so that you can survive. Uh, and and th things change over years. Uh, 30 years ago, Japanese was very important uh, in technical translation. Now it's less important. Other languages like uh, Chinese and Korean are important. German is important. So you have to try to anticipate changes and, and it's not easy, but it's fun and it can be done. I've been doing it for over 30 years. I uh, have been fortunate to be able to provide for a family of four on one income. And, you know, at this point, I don't really have to worry too much because uh, in a few years I'll be on social security and <laughs> I'll just have to downsize and uh, work only. Up. That's my plan anyway, if I feel like working, you know. So, it, you know, I could do it. Uh, most people can do it. But it's important to think ahead and uh, to stay on your toes and not to let yourself intimidate, be intimidated by big agencies and machine translations and all of these things. There is no replacement uh, for human intelligence. Machine, and especially when it comes to language and thinking, it just, I keep reading things in newspapers. Today I read something about the competition they had to, uh, for machines, they tried to create uh, algorithms for machines to create new poetry. Okay, uh, but uh, all the poetry that the machine created was instantly uh, recognized as such. It was not real poetry. It it uh, lacked human spirit, and uh, it always will. It there never will be. That's what I believe. Uh, and definitely not in my lifetime, uh, uh, a mechanical solution to human brain. It's just impossible. Yeah, let's, let's hope that uh, it will be that way for many, many more years to come and we will still have our jobs uh, and we could follow our, our passion for languages and, you know, have the same conversations. Uh, hopefully we, we won't be talking about uh, big agencies abusing us uh, in the future, uh, but you know, uh, it, it, it's up to it's up to us to change the future and shape uh, the way things will develop for all professional translators in, in upcoming years. Exactly, and we can do that when old people like me learn something from young people like you, and and you guys learn from something from me too. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we we learn a great deal from you both, both today and from your blog. So uh, I'm really thankful that uh, you write consistently about very very important issues. Uh, and I haven't seen that many people writing about them uh, with the yeah. same amount of detail and passion like you do. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're always glad to have you back sometime for another episode. Anytime. It will be my pleasure again. Great. Okay, so uh, I think we're going to wrap this uh, up. Uh, Steve, thanks again for joining us tonight. It was a great uh, pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching this episode. Uh, if you guys uh, missed it uh, and uh, couldn't able, wasn't able to join us live, uh, please visit our website at blabintranslators.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list, and that way you will never miss another episode. You will be able to join us. Uh, in real time, ask questions, and have a lot of fun. Uh, thanks again for watching, and have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.